There's this whole myth that it's easier when two guys are involved. Totally untrue. It's, it's, it is not so easy for a guy to meet another guy in this city. It's a Raven Man! <laughs> it was one of the most beloved comedies of its time. I'm excited. I might even wear a jazzy hair clip. <laughs> I might even wear a jazzy hair clip. <laughs> in 1998, Will and Grace brought a new kind of couple to television. <laughs> along with two of the most outrageous sidekicks ever no. created. Knock, anybody homo? I am, I am. Nearly 20 years later, EW is bringing the cast of Will and Grace back together to celebrate their highly anticipated return to primetime. We started reading the script and it was just immediately right like we'd just been gone for the weekend. I always thought about the four of us as, um, as being like an orchestra and each of us playing a different instrument and creating a musicality together. Like comedy is music and I think that's what it was. Once we started playing the music again, it was like, oh, I know how this song goes. Right. <laughs> the following program. Modern style. <laughs> the story of Will and Grace began back in 1997 with television writers David Cohen and Max Muchnick. David Cohen and Max Muchnick were actually friends a long time before they were writing partners. And they worked on a handful of sitcoms, including Dream On, which was a pretty big show for HBO at the time. Don't ignore me, Tom. Tom? Ah! And then in 1996, they created a comedy for NBC called Boston Comet. So by 1997, Cohen and Muchnick had earned a solid reputation as writers in Hollywood. The show um, Mad About You was going off the air, and we had heard Warren Littlefield I and mean, David Nevins, they were at NBC at the time, said we're looking for a romantic comedy to replace Mad About You. And Max and I had always talked about um, my boss, it was a guy named Sidney Pollack when I was an assistant, who eventually ended up playing Will's dad. And he said, I've only ever made love stories. And the love story ends when the boy and the girl kiss. So the story is only as good as the obstacles preventing the boy and the girl from kissing. What are we waiting for? Well, I just, I'm, I, I'm kind of tired, you know, that, that all the turkey. It made me sleepy. Really? Because it made me horny. <laughs> so we're like, we got a story about, about that, Max. We got a story like that in our lives that we can tell. Ow! Elbowed me in the eye. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Max had talked about how back when he was in high school and before he came out, he actually had a girl he dated who was his best friend. So we 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 went about telling this story of uh, myself and uh, the girl that I went to high school with and uh, pretended I was her boyfriend for as long as I possibly could. <laughs> oh. And they were a great couple. The truth of the matter is they yeah. would have been a great couple. See, there's this one teensy little complication. But yeah. there was an obstacle yeah. preventing the boy and the girl from kissing, yeah. right? So it seemed perfect. Are you I'm hungry? Gay. What? what? Are you I'm hungry? gay. What? what? We had pitched Will and Grace as neighbor characters in another show, and Warren Littlefield, to his credit, said, I really feel like the people that live next door should be the center of your show. Why don't you go back and write a show for me about those two, and let's see where that takes us. And that's how we ended up with the pilot of Will and Grace. So I have your blessing then? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cohen and Muchnick's new script revolved around two best friends, Will Truman, a gay lawyer, and Grace Adler, a straight interior designer. The general premise of Will and Grace is that Will Truman and Grace Adler were college best friends turned ill-fated sweethearts. I don't think I really knew for sure until we were in bed together, you know, and I, I took one look at you and your, your sexy underwear and I just went, whoa, I am gay. <laughs> 
Eventually, Will comes out of the closet. You see what a compliment that is? I mean, I mean, I love you. So if I can't make it work with you, then, then it'll never work with any woman because you're perfect for me. And Grace is briefly heartbroken. That is not a compliment. A compliment is you're sexy. You turn me on. That one look at you proves I'm a queer. <laughs> They come back together in New York when Will has a pretty great real estate situation and Grace moves in. I love Will Truman. He is like nothing else that was on TV before. He was uptight and fussy like some stereotypical gay men are, but he was also a lot of fun. Oh. <laughs> Let's go home. Why home? There's a rock in my bum. <laughs> Grace Adler, uh, a little neurotic, very devoted, very smart to find the perfect friend in Will. And he's definitely the calm to her storm because she can be a little nutty. Your boyfriends are like gardeners, and, and you're sort no, of No, 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 no. Do not call me a flower. I am not a flower. I am a gardener, damn it. I do plenty of hoeing. Will and Grace have a completely dysfunctional marriage, except for the marriage part, and the sex part for that matter, too. They are each other's best friends. They're each other's rocks. They're each other's sounding boards. They really are sort of soulmates in that way. I love you. Love you. <laughs> NBC greenlit the pilot. Cohan and Muchnick's next challenge was casting, and the pressure was on to find the perfect Will. There were people at NBC that felt like it was important that the exact right person played Will because they may not have said this, but I know this to be true. It was, it was all about what you were left with. They, they needed to tell themselves that this isn't really who you're watching. You're not really watching a gay guy, America. Don't worry about it, so you can enjoy yourself. That was the hardest for the person who was running NBC at the time. Said, you have to find this guy. You have to find this guy because... I don't want America thinking about butt was basically what he was telling us. The role ultimately went to Eric McCormick. The 35-year-old actor was fresh off a three-year run playing Colonel Clay Mosby in the Western Lonesome Dove, the series, and the sequel, Lonesome Dove, The Outlaw Years. Do you know what a leader is? A leader is a man who will not be defied. This one was a Marvel man, because when I came in to audition with him, you were you were still working on Lonesome Dove. Yeah. Not quite, but, but yeah, yeah. And so he had, like... he had like this, this short beard thing happening and I was just like, oh, hello. And I I was like, hmm, very hetero. Yeah. And then, and then I fixed then, that. Then right he fixed it in two seconds. <laughs> but I do remember us laughing immediately together and feeling very comfortable together. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> he allayed any fears that the executives would have, you know, I don't know, that it would be, I don't know, a queen fest. I don't know what, I don't know what actually they were concerned about, but I kind of know. You're just not my type of woman, okay? I prefer someone taller and uh, with a hairy chest. <laughs> Eric is so skilled and so good and so funny that once he was cast, then it's like, oh, okay, so this is real. It's we can make this show because we, we, have, a user, we have a user-friendly gay. My name is Jack McFarland, but for tonight, I want you to think of me as just Jack. When Sean came in, he, you know, once he left the room, it was like, oh, okay, do we still have to see people for this part? Because it's so clear that he's getting it. Let's play the pyramid. Okay, you two first. Okay, you give, I'll receive. Just as God intended it. Okay. In 1998, NBC greenlit a pilot episode of Will and Grace with creators David Cohen and Max Muchnick at the helm. Damn, we're good. <laughs> the unconventional sitcom revolved around the friendship between a homosexual attorney and a straight interior designer. It's very exciting. Tell me. It's very different. What is it? It's very big. It's very annoying. With Eric McCormick on board to play Will Truman, the role of Grace Adler went to Deborah Messing. I'm Grace. Jack said I was funny. <laughs> no, he said you were sort of funny. <laughs> the 30-year-old actress had made a memorable appearance on Seinfeld as Jerry's girlfriend. Dentist. Yeah, who needs them? Not to mention the blacks and the Jews. 
but Messing was probably best known for playing the female lead in the Fox comedy, Ned and Stacy. Why can't straight men be, I don't know, or gay? Well, darling, if they knew you, they would be. I got the part already and I had read with a bunch of women and it just was never right, it was never right. Deborah was the last one. They, always, they already knew they wanted her, but we couldn't get her and finally she came in. But she's the first actress that ever laughed in the scene, like as if Grace was amused by her friend. <laughs> oh my God. It says it also grows breast tissue. <laughs> you wanna give it a try? <laughs> it was like everyone in the room went, Oh right, that's that's what that's what that's the energy that's supposed to happen. And I remember just I, I was it was killer right from the from the top. Hi, honey, I'm home. Relative newcomer Sean Hayes was chosen to play the flamboyant Jack McFarland. The 28-year-old actor had recently starred as another gay character in the indie film Billy's Hollywood Screen Kiss. I had a good time today, Billy. See, once you accepted the fact that I was exploiting your body, things weren't so bad. Jack is Will's best friend. They met while Will was in college and Jack was in high school and sne snuck into a college party, which was a very funny episode. Hi. <laughs> what are you doing in the closet? I could ask the same of you. Jack was written to be larger than life. And if you recall from his character, he was that. Everything about him was so exaggerated. Uh, the word flamboyant is thrown around so much to talk about um, some gay man. In this case, that's what they wanted. My name is Jack McFarland, but for tonight, I want you to think of me as just Jack. <laughs> when Sean came in, he, you know, once he left the room, it was like, oh, okay, do we still have to see people for this part? Because it's so clear that he's getting it. He was brilliant. I mean, he, I mean, he's brilliant as he always is. God, I had no idea you would be so kitten with a whip. Come on, let's touch stomachs. Oh my Lord, you are a complete freak. Sean, I just remember like, I was getting out of my car and yeah. Sean pulled up, what were you driving, like a Hyundai Toyota or something? Corolla. Toyota yeah. Corolla. With a window out and a hubcap's missing. Right, and so, but you slowed the car down to a, a very slow roll and the window is down and this, these crazy two blue eyes and these teeth like I've never seen. It was like, you know, Matt Damon on steroids. <laughs> looking out the window at me, and I just immediately was like, oh my God, I love him. I didn't even know who you, I didn't even know you were in the cast. I was like, I love him. I'm Karen Walker. I'm supposed to be Grace's assistant. <laughs> Rounding out the cast was 39-year-old Megan Mullally as the boozy socialite Karen Walker. I don't think I can go on. Karen, what no, are you doing? Me. Stop me. Karen, don't be ridiculous. There we go, nice and cold. <laughs> Megan Mullally had done a string of guest starring roles on various sitcoms, and like her co-star Deborah Messing was on an episode of Seinfeld. Would, would you mind switching seats? <laughs> oh, actually, I'd really prefer to sit here. I, I don't hear very well out of this ear, so. <laughs> and fun fact, early on in her career, she did a McDonald's spot with John Goodman. Nothing, nothing like an egg McMuffin. And now, there's nothing like the price. McDonald's and you. Karen Walker's character kind of reminds me of that inner bitchy voice that all we women have. Well, we don't say, but we're thinking it. Whereas Karen just says it. Well, well. I've never seen trash take itself out. <laughs> Karen is actually married to a rich businessman named Stan, who you never see on camera. Sometimes he's just out of frame. You might even see a hand. It's one of the running jokes of the series. Do you really want that on your conscience, huh? Do you? Damn it, Stanley, not in front of the hill. Maggie was all, she was all downtown and punk when we met, right? It was, it was all black clothes and black hair and kind of tragic. And I was just kind of like, wow. I didn't hot. see Karen this way. It was, it was hot. But I just didn't see Karen that way, so the whole the whole thing that we now know is uh, was not not first impression. To explain my clothing choices, because I had no money, I had two hundred dollars into my name when we started the pilot. So my clothes were all from the thrift shop. So they were very. Um, they probably did look kind of rock and roll because I like I would take a skirt and cut it off with a pair of scissors yeah. at the bottom. Around the world, around the world, one way ticket. Brazil, Bangkok, uh-huh, yeah, you feel the difference? Yeah. yeah. 
I don't think there are two characters that are more fun on TV to watch than Karen and Jack. They are super playful. I feel kind of dirty. In the good way. They will go out and do anything and egg on each other, and yet they bring some heart to the role too, so you're rooting for them at the end of the day, even if they are taking on Will and Grace. Weird. Well, what do you think's wrong? She just asked a fairy an engine question. <laughs> NBC filmed the pilot in March 1998. It's gonna be a good one. I can feel it. It's always good. Still. When the episode was screened for test audiences, the feedback was positive, but confusing. You want me to uh, talk you through it? <laughs> it's tempting, but I think I'll watch ER here. When the show tested 20 years ago, uh, half of the audience that watched the show didn't realize why, at the end, they didn't get together. Eric LaSalle just smiled. Really? No. <laughs> and those people were, like, of their right minds. I mean, they, they weren't drunk. Did you buy anything? Yeah, I got a great camisole. Yeah, sexy? I'm going to sleep. Ask me in the morning. <laughs> and still, at the end of uh, that first test, that initial test, a lot of people wanted to know, well, why don't they get together? Was that Danny? Yeah. Jealous? <laughs> Honey, I don't need your man. I got George Clooney. The entire first scene, the, the conversation was them on the phone in their respective houses watching ER and, and talking about how sexy George Clooney was. Sorry, babe. He doesn't bat for your team. Well. He hasn't seen me pitch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that we, that we thought was a giveaway. Yeah. Grace, I think it's time for a couple of blue bippies. <laughs> I don't want any pills. They're not for you, honey. They're for me. <laughs> the pilot, uh, yeah, I had, I, like I said, I had $200 to my name, and I went out and, um, as soon as we got the check for the pilot, I bought a, went out and bought a Range Rover. <laughs> this is stupid. I'm an idiot, an amazing businesswoman. But then, you know, it did get picked up, so shoo, I'm not in jail. NBC eventually greenlit a 22-episode first season. When Will and Grace premiered on September 21st, 1998, more than 8 million viewers tuned in. What are you doing? Hanging out. Not bad, considering they were up against the ABC juggernaut, Monday Night Football. When Will and Grace began, it was a trailblazer. That's just the thing Will and I you probably didn't get it. Oh, oh, darling, whatever I don't get, I just figure it's gay. <laughs> you think of television today, and you think at how fully realized gay characters are on television. Uh, there wasn't that back when the show launched. Coming out of the closet is something you only do once in life, you know? It's like being born or watching Magic Johnson's talk show. <laughs> There was nothing uh, quite like this, where the gay guy was a self-possessed, fully fleshed out character at the center of the show. That really wasn't going on. Grace, did you know I was gay when you met me? My dog knew. <laughs> when it came on the air, it was just one of those undeniable things that viewers responded to. The writing was really strong, the chemistry was just incredible and immediate. I just need something. Like a, like a new direction. That, that way. way. <laughs> you bought into these characters and you wanted to know more about them. And the show is pretty body, um, not B-O-D-Y, but B-A-W-D-Y. I'll need a little money from the ATM. <sighs> denied, denied, approved. <laughs> The humor was like PG-13 or R-rated at some time, and it was nice. It was it's nice to laugh at those jokes. Now for my next trick, I will ask my lovely assistant to step inside the magic box. Uh oh, I might be a little rusty. I haven't done that since my junior year at Sarah Lawrence. <laughs> I feel like uh, you know, gay men and straight women and were everywhere all throughout the country. That relationship was just everywhere, but no one was writing about it or putting it on TV, and we just lucked it out that we did it first. Part of the reason it's fun to watch the reruns is because I'm hearing things that we only said one, one like time. You will not believe the day I've had. Something must be done. Look, it's notorious F.A.G. <laughs> Oh,
What did, did you and Danny have a fight? Yeah, but I, I don't want to talk about it right now. I can't even think straight. That's funny. Neither can Jack. <laughs> In 1998, Will and Grace premiered to rave reviews, and within two years became one of the most popular comedies on television. Will, what are you doing? I think you've sprung a leak. What are you talking about? <gasps> During the show's eight season run, Will and Grace received a staggering 83 Emmy nominations with 16 wins, including awards for each of the four cast members and a best comedy win for creators David Cohen and Max Muchnick. The reviews are in, and the critics agree the show's a smash! Our goal was basically to make it so that these characters acted with each other the way people we know would act with each other. So it wasn't like we were trying to find boundaries to crash through. It was just we were trying to figure out who these characters were and the way they would behave, really, is what it was. If you want to break into the Fag Four, this symbol of gay oppression has got to go. Come on, Jackie, get rid of it. Who knew I could do that? I've seen this show maybe three or four times the whole time. Really? And like somebody said to me, so when Stan died, and I was like, Stan died? And I know what it feels like to have your man be far away. <sighs> Ever since Stan died, I barely see him anymore. <laughs> and then they were like, yeah, but then he came back. And I was like, he did? He's kidding, Mr. Stan isn't dead. He was in trouble, Karen, he, he had to disappear. I'm ready for our date. Stan may be alive, but he's still dead to me. Ciao. I don't remember any, any but what I do so remember funny. in my bones is not only the character, but the all of the characters and the inner and the dynamics between the characters. I feel so sad. <laughs> Grace, will you change my eyebrow? Because those that's what's so great about the show. You know, aside from the great writing, the jokes, is the, the interplay between the four characters. There's this endless number of uh, permutations that you can have between the four of us, and I think that's something that's just there. Jack, I know this may come as a shock to you, but your father is a black boy. <laughs> Remember there was an episode where Jack mistakenly thought he was part black. That he, and, and he walked into the room and I referred to him as the, uh, the notorious F.A.G. You will not believe the day I've had. Something must be done. Look, it's notorious F.A.G. <laughs> That's funny. I don't remember that. I talked to Mother last night and it turns out I'm not black. Honey, I won't believe it. I mean, look at you. It's true. I'm not black. I'm a black. She got knocked up by one of the black boys, an Irish Catholic family from her hometown. I'm gonna mess it up. I mean, the, just, the, just the one that felt like so quintessential Will and Grace to me was, my love for you is like chicken. It's, it's deep, it's something in deep. It's like, do you remember that? <laughs> the point is, my love for you is like this scar. Ugly, but permanent. <laughs> Yeah, I can vaguely. We're old. We're old. <laughs> yeah. That's the other thing that's changed. Yeah. Now we're old. Oh, 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 old? <laughs> well, how do you know there are parts of me that were just a twinkle in a scientist's eye three weeks ago? <laughs> My favorite thing about the show, for sure, is that no matter what we got to Tuesday night with, we would do that for the audience, one take, but, but then everything would get rewritten. Uh, not everything, but uh, jokes that worked would get rewritten because we already have it. Jokes that didn't work, we get. So a lot of the, part of the reason it's fun to watch the reruns is because I'm hearing things that we only said one, one time. Neil, yeah. what are you, that's why I said I hold your hand, but I draw the line. No, we are stalking Kevin Bacon, come on, come on. Max Munchnik whispers or David whispers something in your ear. Sometimes I wouldn't even tell you and I, I throw something new at you. Don't stand too close to the glass, Clarice. <laughs> I lied. <laughs> It'd be like, cut this, cut this, cut this, cut this. This is your new line, your new line, your new line, go. The other night in bed, I called Josh Ben. And to cover it, I stretched it out into bend over and... <laughs> so alive, and, and that's why some of the lines are, are hard to remember because we literally said them one time. I ended up doing something I really never want to do again. <laughs>
Good thing Ben's name isn't Pee Wee. I'm so glad George Clooney came back to ER. I remember your storyline so well in the finale. I just thought it was so clever. One, two... Wait. Oh, why'd you stop me? I was gonna say three, four, slam it, whore. <laughs> Will and Grace ran for eight seasons and 194 episodes. That is oddly specific. But in May 2006, the beloved comedy came to an end with an emotional hour-long series finale. Answer me this. If you're in Rome, raising this baby with Leo, where am I? I don't know. Eventually in the finale, what builds is that you Will and Grace uh, have a falling out. Wow. What, you don't, you don't like the changes that we made? No, no, it's not that. It's I just don't live here anymore. And when the show was ending, they were both in marriages, basically. But now, I think it's over. It just feels like a closed chapter. And so, ultimately, they go on to not see each other for 20 years. You believe in destiny, Ben? They each went their own ways and raised their families. Um, in one of the final scenes of the finale, you find out that Will's um, and Grace's children are attending Columbia together, just as Will and Grace did, and they live across the hall from each other. In this case, both the children are straight, and is this a chance that Will and Grace will like fall in love and get married through their children? Hi. Hi. I remember your storyline so well in the finale. I just thought it was so clever that they all went out, had a baby, and then the the son and the daughter came, was at the college together. Hi. Hi. I'm Ben. I'm Lila. Yeah. You want to get a cup of coffee or something? Oh, well, my mom's going to be back any second with some stuff from my room. Yeah, so is my dad. We leave now, we can miss him. Let's go. <laughs> of course, this brings Will and Grace back together. And the symmetry is amazing because the kids are meeting across the hall from each other, which is how Will and Grace first met. I'm going to go get a piece of Cafeteria cake? Oh, uh, Lila's expecting me any minute. Yeah, so it's Ben. If we go now, we can miss him. Let's go. I think I feel a song coming on. <laughs> then a song we shall have. In the finale, we also see that Karen and Jack are living together in a fabulous apartment. Unforgettable. And in their final scene, they sing a beautiful rendition of Unforgettable, which brought me to tears. Then you cut to Will and Grace on their couches, their respective couches once again. They're talking about ER once again, like in the pilot. What are you doing? Watching TV. Me too. I'm so glad George Clooney came back to ER. <laughs> They're also talking about uh, a dress that um, Will thinks is a bad choice. For Grace. I'm having second thoughts about the dress. My dress or Lila's wedding dress? Yours. Then you quickly learn that it's the dress that Grace is planning to wear to the wedding of her daughter to Will's son. I'm not crazy about the trim. Will, you never were. <laughs> so there is a little bit of a, a nice, nice neat bow there where that kind of suggests that after that rocky 20 year period of them not being together, they do come together as a family yet again. I'm gonna propose a toast to family. Family that loves you and accepts you for exactly who you are. Boring. <laughs> it's always sad when you see uh, a big popular comedy go away because, you know, this, this a show was a part of your life. And it's sad when they go away because you're afraid there's not going to be anything else like them. And the fact is, there really hasn't been. I emailed Max Munchnik and I said, why can't we do this show again? And he emailed right back, we can. Ugh, Lila was so skinny her whole first year. What'd you feed her? The boob. <laughs> Portion control, smart. In 2006, after eight seasons, 83 Emmy nominations, and nearly 200 episodes, Will and Grace bid farewell with an emotional series finale. Grace, I don't want to fight with you anymore. I don't either. I just want us to be us again. I do too. I... <sighs> do you 
find them exhausting. <laughs> Ten years later, in the summer of 2016, the presidential election was starting to heat up. What are we gonna do? We're gonna make America great again. You watch. A man you can bait with a tweet is not a man we can trust with nuclear weapons. David Cohen and Max Muchnick suddenly had an idea to bring back the cast, in character, for a 10-minute sketch to encourage viewers to get out and vote. You have to vote! No, it is un-American not to. But does my vote even matter? I mean, how can one unemployed white fella registered in Pennsylvania make a difference? <laughs> my husband and I were on a holiday um, coming back from London, and we were sitting in a cab talking about the election and I thought of a joke that I would have done or wanted to do if the show was still around and my husband said well you and Dave still have the set you know you could do the show right now if you wanted to do the show this just sucks <laughs> can you believe this is the world we live in no it's criminal how is it possible that Donald Trump is a nominee for president of the United States oh not what I was reading <laughs> I called him first and then wrote an email to the four of them the next day at work and it takes me about 40 minutes to get home and by the time I got home there were four yeses uh, to this request to do this scene and it was amazing and uh, we just gave them a date and brought everybody back together. It's all gonna come down to undecided voters in Pennsylvania anyway. Right, right, the unemployed, uneducated, angry white man. Do we even know anyone like that? I am livid! <laughs> we got together and had our little skit. You know, that I think was the most sort of like, wah, moment, right? When we walked on the set for the first time and the props were the same. Why does everything in there look 10 years old? <laughs> And then it was just having that experience of playing together and it feeling familiar. That's when I felt like, oh, I, I, I can see doing this and I want to do this with these people. Jack, you're voting for Hillary, right? Of course he is. Don't pigeonhole me. Not all gays think alike. Oh, I oh, forgot, forgot to ask, ask did, did you see Ryan Lochte get attacked, attacked on Dancing with the Stars? <laughs> On September 26th, the night of the first presidential debate, the video was released online and immediately went viral. Well, who are you voting for? I don't know, Grace. Maybe I'll stay home on December 1st. <laughs> as, as it was over, that election video we did, it wasn't a big surprise that, oh, even Megan was like, I think they're gonna ask us to do the show again because we all felt something. Jump, 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 jump. And I read the script, and I got, read the last page, and I shut the script, and I picked up my phone, and I emailed Max Munchnick, and I said, why can't we do the show again? And he emailed right back, we can. Again, Bob, so excited. I can't believe we're back at NBC, taking the old peacock for another ride around the, uh, okay. the thing. In January 2017, NBC announced Will and Grace would be returning for a ninth season. The first of 12 new episodes is scheduled to premiere on September 28th. Oh my God. One of the reasons why I thought it would be good to do this again, I, because of course I, I was nervous about it, but it seems to me that there is something like familiar and comforting about these characters and about the sound that this show produced for eight or nine years. And in times that feel so anxious, you know, and, and everybody seems on edge and is looking for something to kind of more than, we feel unmoored, I think, as people right now. And there's something comfortable about that sort of familiarity, about that sound that I think is worth, it's worth going back to. This is our home. There's nothing scary here. What? Yeah! <laughs> What's going on? What's happening? Who rang that bell? We definitely know that obviously it's set in 2017. It's where they are today. What if something fundamental has changed? I really think you're gonna like the unit. And the apartment's not bad either. <laughs> Nobody's changed. We're gonna play a little revisionist history. Forget about what you know with the finale. They're not gonna start there. I mean, that's the beauty of make-believe. We don't have to go there if we don't want to. We're gonna go back to Will's apartment. He's still there. Grace is still there. Jack is still next door. Karen is still off being rich. And 
it just they're resuming their lives as great friends. Yeah. <laughs> really nice. How lucky are we that we have Will and Grace and Jack and Karen to tell some of these stories because we get to talk about things, just put it through those mouths and those brains. And we're not being heavy uh, because we never were heavy. We never took on the subject of gay men in America or gay men, period, or the gay story or plight. We never did that in a heavy way. We just managed it in the way that we manage our lives, like uh, with as much humor and, and to connect uh, connect it to as many people who will relate to it as we possibly can. And I think that that's what we're gonna try to do again. Uh, when our show started, uh, Clinton was in impeachment hearings and then Al Gore got screwed and then there was 9-11 and Iraq. We didn't address any of that. Our show existed at a time when lots of bad <laughs> was happening and we had a lot of fun. And so I think while we won't back away from this existence at the moment, we will uh, also be overcoming it and having a lot of fun. Yeah. That's, that's the reason why I wanted to come back, was I was like, I really need to laugh. <laughs>